Hello everyone, welcome back. Welcome to this third session on using Earth observations to monitor water budgets for river basin management. This is the third and final session of this webinar series. In first week, we had a review and an exercise to download uh, remote sensing data and global data assimilation modeling data uh, of water budget components for a river basin. We focused on the Limpopo River Basin in Southern Africa and downloaded data for, uh, from these various data sources. Then in week two, uh, we focused on remote sensing observations. We looked at precipitation from GPM iMERGE, evapotranspiration from MODIS MOD16, and uh, terrestrial water storage change from GRACE data, again over the Limpopo Basin. What we did was we derived wet and dry season water budget components and looked at differences between them using GIS and also used uh, GIS to do zonal statistics to, to derive basin averaged precipitation, evapotranspiration, and water storage change rates. And so we had a demonstration for year 2016 and then you your exercise focused on year 2019. Today we are going to do pretty much the same but instead of using remote sensing data now we are going to focus on GLDAS data. Just like uh, week one and two, after this short presentation, we will have a demonstration uh, and then you will have a lab time to repeat the steps that we go through in this demonstration. Again, focusing on GLDAS, uh, precipitation, evapotranspiration, uh, terrestrial water storage change and runoff also. So that's what we will do. Then week one and two, the uh, homeworks were already posted on our set website. Today's homework is also available from the website and the due dates are given here, 11th, 18th and 25th of August respectively. Now those of you who attend all three webinars and complete all the homework assignments and submit by due dates will receive a certificate of uh, completion in about two months after the series is over and you will receive this certificate from Marinas Martins. So this is today's outline. We will have a brief review of GLDAS data, which actually we already saw in week one. Uh, then we will have a demonstration in which we will use GLDAS 2.1 data primarily to look at different water budget components over the Limpopo River Basin. However, we are also going to demonstrate using GLDAS version 2.2. And uh, in your exercise, you will focus on 2.1, but we want to show this uh, newer version of 2.2, just so that in future, if you want to use this data, uh, you can follow the same steps and use 2.2. Then we will have a summary of this entire uh, series focusing on sources of uncertainties in water budget estimation from various data sets that we used in week two and today. And then you will have lab time to work on GLDAS 2.1 data analysis in QGIS. And last half hour, we will have question and answer session. So we will start with a brief review of GLDAS data. So this is the basic water balance equation that we saw in week one. So if you consider a river basin, precipitation is the source of water and uh, evapotranspiration, uh, water storage and discharge from the river basin, that is equivalent to precipitation over a certain time period. And so this is the basic water balance equation. We saw that in remote sensing data, we had precipitation uh, ET and DS available to us, but we did not have any information about discharge from remote sensing. From GLDAS data, runoff is calculated. So we will have all of these components actually, and we will be able to look at um, seasonal differences between them also. So, 
GLDAS version 2.1 and 2.2. Uh, then the websites have a lot of information. Um, these are the newer versions of GLDAS model. Uh, they both have uh, boundary conditions from vegetation mask, land water mask, leaf area index from MODIS. Uh, they both use forcing data such as precipitation, weather data, and surface radiation. But they both use different sources for forcing, and we'll see that. Uh, GLDAS 2.2 actually assimilates Gray's terrestrial water storage anomaly. Um, and it, this version is using catchment land surface model or CLSM. This is the one um, we downloaded for GLDAS 2.1 as well, but that version does not assimilate GRACE data. So GLDAS 2.1 is available since 2000 January and 2.2 is available since 2003 January after GRACE data became available. So here's a table describing inputs for both these versions. For GLDAS 2.1, precipitation data are obtained from Global Precipitation Climatology Project, or GPCP. These are multi-satellite and rain gauge based data sets, combined data. Weather data or meteorological data is obtained from NSEP GDA systems, um, as shown here. And surface radiation uh, is received from Air Force Weather Agency. All these inputs in GLDAS 2.2 are coming from European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting or ECMWF system. And uh, one thing to note here though is that these forcing data are not uh, open source. So they are not available for distribution. So not available online for with us. But um, other outputs are there from G, uh, same as GLDAS 2.1, 2.1 and 2.2. So here are the integrated outputs. They both have evapotranspirations, surface and subsurface runoff, terrestrial water storage and snow water equivalent. Also has multi-layer soil moisture. So this is a model. So you have all the water and energy parameters available to you, except that GLDAS 2.2 does not have precipitation as we mentioned earlier. Also notice the difference in resolution here. GLDAS 2.1 is one degree uh, by one degree, whereas 2.2 is quarter degree by quarter degree. These data are available in three hourly and monthly time scale. Uh, GLDAS 2.2 right now available to us are on daily time scale. We decided to go with GLDAS 2.1 because um, partly um, precipitation we can look at, which we don't have here. So to look at every component, also, the monthly data are available here. So to do calculation, it's easier to work with monthly time scale than daily. And considering that limited time we have for this exercise and webinar, we decided let's go with monthly GLDAS 2.1 data. And that way we have all the water budget components as well. So today though, in the demonstration, what we'll do is first we'll start with GLDAS 2.1. Your exercise will focus on GLDAS 2.1. But as a part of this demonstration, we will also show how to get GLDAS 2.2 uh, water budget components. And then you can go through the similar procedure, um, just like you do for GLDAS 2.1, you can do for 2.2 to look at different water budget components. Um, you will not be uh, replicating uh, the steps for 2.2, but this is for your information. So with that, we will start with the demonstration. So the first demonstration will be using GLDAS 2.1 data. And there will be three parts to this exercise. Uh, you will follow these steps. But the first one is to convert units of all water budget components into millimeter per month and then add them to get seasonal accumulated water components. If you recall in GLDAS 2.1 data that you downloaded, each one, each parameter, precipitation, evapotranspiration, runoff, and uh, total uh, terrestrial water storage, they all have different units. 
so we want to first convert the units and then estimate uh, water budget components for each season wet and dry and then we will go through the um, raster analysis and zonal statistics like we did in week two so just a note about converting units so for the limpopo basin shape file uh, we will be using precipitation uh, which uh, and evapotranspiration both they have units of kilogram per meter square per second these are average over um, this month but so this is the rate in per second as you can see and um, if you look at runoff it is accumulated over three hours and TWS which actually is in millimeter per month so this we do not have to convert uh, units because it's already in millimeters but for precipitation evapotranspiration and runoff we have to use these formulae uh, for PR and ET uh, to convert that in millimeter because um, of the wa water density um, kilogram per meter squared is equivalent to you can say millimeter so that it remains the same but for this time unit now we are going to uh, multiply these data by 3600 seconds per hour uh, 24 hours per day and number of days in the month that we are considering so for December this will be 31 days for January 31 with February if it is 28 but if it is leap year then it will be 29 um, so that's what we will be doing for runoff uh, since this is three hour accumulation data uh, we multiply it by eight three hour segments in a day and then there are a number of days in month. So uh, for December, we take a runoff for December, multiply by eight and multiply by number of days in that month. So that is what we will be doing. And so we'll start with the QGIS, QGIS project uh, now. Um, let's see. Okay, so I have this project open here first just like we did last week we are going to have a base map i'm going to pick google road but you can pick anything you like and then you will be adding the vector file which is the limpopo river basin shape file that you have been using and so open that and add that and you can zoom to this layer and you can change properties just like we did last time uh, simple feel simple outline and you can choose color we always choose blue for some reason and here you can change the thickness of the line and then you have this shape file now we can start adding all the rasters so I'm going to demonstrate this for 2016 and you will be doing this for 2019 um, add raster and I'm going to go to the file where I have all the data from GLDAS 2.1 you have these data for 2019 that you downloaded in week one so let's start with precipitation so I can add December um open add and then january and february also so precipitation um, january and february and you can open and add so now i have uh, January, February and December. So this is the wet season for uh, 16. So December, January and February. And let's see unit conversion for this. And I'm going to demonstrate this. Okay, you can, you can see that the projection has an issue here. So you don't see the data. Okay. So I think you will have to make sure that the projection is right. So then you will, it is 
EPSG 4326 and then they show up. You can move this shape file up above and let's start. Uh, for unit conversion, we will use raster calculator. Go to raster calculator and save this file. So let's see P I'm going to save as precipitation for December. It's a short name for now. And then take precipitation for December, multiply it by 3600 seconds per day, uh, per hour, 24 hours per day, and uh, 31 days per month. So this is going to give us precipitation for December. Okay, uh, You can do the same for January. And then for February, then uh, let's do for January anyway. So you can do raster calculator. Um, let's save this as year for January um, and then take January multiplied by 3600 multiplied by 24 multiplied by 31 okay and let's do it for February calculator save it as year February uh, take February multiplied by 3600 multiplied by 24 now 2016 is a leap year so we will have 29 days in February and so we will have that okay now we have December January and February uh, precipitation in um, millimeters per month here and we are going to accumulate over this entire wet season and so again we use raster calculator and let's see PR DJF you can give this name um, and now you can just add these three rasters and say okay and here is what you get for your wet season precipitation okay so let me uh, I already have colored this and I can we, we did this last time but let's see you can go to properties single band pseudo color and let's pick color ramp that is um, red yellow and blue um, we can keep the same range here take equal intervals to me say 15 or so and say okay and then you will have precipitation for uh, December January February in this case this is 2016 as you can see again as we saw last time from iMERGE the southern part of basin has higher precipitation than than northern part uh, this of course is one degree resolution so it, you can see these boxes here you will do exactly the same for evapotranspiration. That means you can go back to your GLDAS uh, uh, directory where you saved uh, your file from week one. And you can add ET. Okay, so um, going back, I'm sorry. Pre PR also precipitation. Similarly, for you will do it for June, July, August. So for June, then the multiplication will be 30 days. July and August will be 31 days. But exactly the same formula you will use. And the same thing with uh, ET. You can take uh, ET data and add and go through the same calculation. Uh, go to raster calculator, uh, pick ET and multiply it by this is December. So 3600 multiplied by 24 multiplied by 31 in here and you can go through this uh, pro steps and i already have precipitation and evapotranspiration for wet and dry season going through all these steps uh, and it, i've saved them in a project that we will see next but before we do that let's look at runoff because that has a different unit conversion involved in here so add here Again, go to the GLDAS directory where you have saved file 
and let's start with runoff for December 15 for wet season add close uh, here you you have runoff this is accumulated over three hours so what we're going to do is raster calculator here we can save it as rod okay just for simple name then take this file this data multiplied by 8 and multiplied by 31 so now here uh, since it is in millimeter per three hours this is what we are doing and say okay and so here you have december runoff in millimeters per month which is from 0 to 18 and you will load runoff for january february and then june july august and go through the similar conversion Re select the raster multiply by eight and then number of days in that month and you will have runoff so let's let's add the last water budget component which is the water storage and we want to look at water storage change in the wet season and dry season so just like we did last week with grace data we are going to take march uh, 16 water storage data and december 15 water storage data and subtract december from march to get that difference in storage for the wet season and similarly take difference between september and june of 16 for getting uh, terrestrial water storage change for the dry season and so let's uh, see uh, let's add those rasters first um, also remember that these um, data TWS data are in millimeters so we don't have to change units so let let's add TWS for December 15 add um, okay and then add TWS for March 16 is March 16 open and add and so you have March and December total water storage data here uh, again we use raster calculator and save this say as DTWS change in TWS for DJF and take March minus December and save and so here is what you have you will do the same with September and June so now when you go through this for each season you will have you will have everything in millimeters accumulated over wet and dry season and I have saved this In this project here so this is the project with all the rasters all the water budget components from GLDAS precipitation evapotranspiration surface runoff and change in water storage for wet season and dry season for completeness I've done this for January to December entire year and you can do that if you have time but for the exercise you can focus on wet and dry seasons also note that in week one along with surface runoff we downloaded base flow runoff but if you load the raster in here you will see that base flow runoff is negligibly small it's almost zero over this basin if you look at precipitation for wet season it is this is accumulated over the season it's about 62 to 340 ET is about 72 to 278 runoff and water storage change their order of magnitude smaller compared to P and E as one would expect because they result from difference between P and E and so here a runoff is about 0.5 to 38 change in water storage is about 3 to 80.9 this is over the entire basin this is the range and so next what we want to do is very much the similar procedure we did last week 
So only difference so far was that we changed units for GLDAS version 2.1 as there are different units compared to remote sensing data we saw. We had to convert everything to millimeter. From now onwards, uh, we're going to do pretty much the same like we did last week. That means take zonal statistics. And so for that, we're going to start with just go to this toolbox and search for zonal statistics. And you will have this zonal statistics window. You will have all the rasters here. We'll go one by one. So let's start with precipitation, wet season. Vector a layer for which you want statistics is the Limpopo Basin and appropriate column prefix. So here it's wet season precipitation. And just like last week, let's pick mean. So here you get me special mean of the seasonal accumulated data um, over each sub-basin and say OK and run. Then you can repeat this procedure for all the rasters. So you can uh, also do now ET. Only thing you change is prefix and the raster. So just like last week. And so you can do that. And once you do that, you can, I have done this for all rasters, so we will look at that in Excel. But once you do that, you can go to uh, this Limpopo River Basin layer, control click and open attribute table. And you will see that what we did here was ETW and PRW uh, we have here. Um, you can highlight any of these basins and it will show you uh, where you're looking at. So for that particular sub-basin, you can look at mean precipitation, evapotranspiration, other data sets. Um, you, you are going to repeat this for, for all rasters. In addition, as you remember, we want area of each sub-basin so that you can have, uh, we can have accumulated water over entire basin. So Next thing to do is calculate area of each sub-basin and you can use this field calculator. Uh, say area, we want decimal numbers. Um, let's have a big number here and two digit precision is okay. Once you do that, you can go to geometry and pick taller area, double click and say okay. And this gives you area of each of these sub basins. So once you have that, uh, you can save uh, and then what you can do is highlight this layer, go to layer options up there and save as and this opens this window where you can save the attribute table as a CSV file. We've been through this exercise before, so you can just save it as uh, an Excel CSV file. Uh, I've already saved this, so I'm going to share that with you. You can see this is the column with uh, sub-basin areas, and these columns here are wet and dry, precipitation, ET, water storage change, and runoff. And last four columns now show the same components for entire year, January to December of 2016. The last row here, that shows mean for entire basin. Simply just take a mean for each sub-basin. Uh, mean from each sub-basin is taken to calculate basin mean. And so numbers shown here in millimeters are just mean precipitation, evapotranspiration, etc. So you can compare how uh, things change from uh, one season to another over entire basin, how the averages change. And then these numbers are actually for the entire year that you can see. Now, if you remember to get total amount of water, the water volume, what we did last time is we converted each of these columns from millimeter to meter cube by multiplying by area and converting into meter. So I'm going to show this one column. We've already done this last week with remote sensing data. So let's see, we can call this PRW in meter cube. 
and for that what you will do is take area and wet season precipitation and multiply it by 001 to get it in meter and so this is the number we get in meter cube if you just drag this you will get this based on these numbers and so you have all this in um, uh, meter cube here you can again what we did last time we're going to do that again uh, add all these numbers not take average but summation because now we want to look at total volume of water so this is based on this mean precipitation uh, per meter square multiplied by meter square we get these numbers and then when you add you get total volume of water in meter cube to convert this into billion cubic meters of water that is more conventionally used we're just going to multiply this number by 10 to the minus 9 this is just unit conversion again and so we get this is in BCM so this is wet season precipitation and we, we will repeat for all these columns and so then um, I have done that already so here is what you get so we have everything in mean here and then we have this billion cubic meters all the way from here to here for wet and dry season let's highlight and then this numbers are for January to December 2016 so total numbers are given here in uh, cubic uh, billion cubic meter these numbers I have here are for comparison from remote sensing data as you can see there are differences and we will uh, talk about these uncertainties here you can actually take uh, precipitation minus evapotranspiration minus uh, water storage and that should give you a residual uh, not exactly runoff because this runoff does not include surface water but the number should be close so uh, we're not trying to close water balance here uh, but we're trying to look at each component and see how it behaves over this basin over this different season and then annually so you can do this annually and interannually to see the difference in general how overall water bed components are changing so next you will be working on exercise 3 during the lab time but before we start I just wanted to quickly show you how to get GLDAS version 2.2 data and for that uh, we're going to use this Joani portal uh, this is the site we use to download iMERGE precipitation and uh, that was demonstrated by Sean McCartney uh, last week so uh, we, we can follow the similar procedure just in the search box you can say GLDAS 2.2 and search and that gives you all the variables available from this model you can see the units here these are daily data and then these are quarter degree resolution data for these uh, dates so um, as we mentioned earlier GLDAS 2.2 does not have precipitation data that's the forcing data from ECMWF that's not available here but these are the outputs that we are interested in so evapotranspiration surface runoff subsurface base flow and then terrestrial water storage uh, the reason to show this is for the units uh, evapotranspiration has the same unit as GLDAS version uh, 2.1 but runoff here is different it, these are all the same kilograms per meter square per second so all you have to do is convert these time units into uh, millimeters per month if you want to do from daily data then from from this rate first of all you can take average map so you have average uh, rate in kilograms per meter square per second for uh, a, a given month and then you can multiply by 3600 by 24 number of day of month just like we did 
uh, a few minutes ago. So you will do the same for runoff also, which was different in GLDAS version 2.1. It was three hourly accumulated data, that's why. And this is again in millimeter, so this does not need unit conversion that way. So again, uh, you can pick uh, the region of your interest. Here we have picked uh, Limpopo Basin. Uh, just through this shapefile selector like before and this is first month of uh, wet season of 2016 and you will have to do it month by month convert the unit in QGIS and then do addition for season um, or any if you want one year or multiple years you can do that too and then just plot result takes you to plotting page which I already have done here so you can look at uh, let's see here this is terrestrial water storage this is evapotranspiration you can see this is higher resolution it is quarter degree um, and you can just down click on downloads and then this you can download these data so this particular one um, is for 2018 uh, but you can select any month or year and download all the data at the same time these are geotiff files so here you can pick multiple parameters and download these files um, so this was just a quick demonstration of how to get uh, version 2.2 data and then how to do unit conversion just wanted to point that out so uh, next uh, let's just summarize what we saw here so we had the demonstration for 15 and 16 and uh, we also saw water components how to get from 2.1 and 2.2 and before you start working on the exercise here is an overall summary First of all, uh, this three session webinar was primarily focused on demonstration and hands on exercise to learn GIS based analysis of the key water budget components um, over a basin and we picked the Limpopo River Basin. We looked at remote sensing based observations and looked at GLDAS model outputs. So using the example of Limpopo River Basin, which is about 405 thousand kilometers square amounts of precipitation evapotranspiration and change in terrestrial water storage in the basin for dry and wet seasons were calculated uh, so last week we did gpm imerge for precipitation modis for evapotranspiration and grace for terrestrial water storage um, anomalies and then this week we looked at gldas both we followed the same procedure and for the year that we considered for the demonstration here, um, I showed you that I have also done annual uh, calculations and that's the comparison presented here for uh, annual precipitation, evapotranspiration and the water storage change data from GLDAS 2.1 and 2 and also remote sensing observations. If you look at the range of differences we got, again, these are for annual time scale. You can do the same numbers for dry and wet season. What we got here for annual time scale for this year was the range of was about 30%, 13% for precipitation, 16% for ET, and 21% for water storage change, and 8% for runoff for between 2.1 and 2 over this basin so uh, of course the remote sensing based data and model based data have differences and these are the ranges so these are actually the uncertainty range you, range you can consider based on this year you would be doing this for multiple years to to see what the range is so for more accurate quantitative estimation of water budget um, the, it continues to be a challenge because there are a variety of reasons for that and when you look at different data sets or different models you get this spread of values and that are helpful in estimating um, and assessing uncertainties so <clears throat> that's something to keep in mind and so what are these 
sources of uncertainties that we can expect in water budget estimation and why it continues to be a challenge to close any water balance. Um, so first of all, there are barriers in estimating total water budget using remote sensing and also modeling data due to limitations in both these techniques, observations as well as models. All the water components, uh, they have um, uncertainties and there is always some water missing actually. Not all the water is unaccounted uh, for when you use these observations such as when we looked at remote sensing, we did not have runoff data. When we have modeling data, uh, it does not have uh, stream flow or surface water, then no irrigation is included. Groundwater pumping is not included or, or diversion. So there's, there's always idealized way of looking at water bu budget in, in these cases, whereas it, it misses some water, it's not accounting for all the water. Also terrestrial water storage anomalies from GRACE and GRACE follow on, they have resolution of about three degree by three degree and cannot provide accurate information for watershed smaller than 150,000 kilometers square. We saw that last week also we mentioned this. And so uncertainty become um, larger for smaller areas uh, of study and it depends on the shape of the basin also, how much it is actually covered uh, with grace uh, footprint. So that uh, we saw also last time that for, for small basin, you really don't have you, uh, enough good independent data from grace to look at uh, terrestrial water storage. Also, uh, mod 16 evapotranspiration that uh, we saw it may have significant uncertainties depending on watershed characteristics and some of the references are mentioned here. You will find them at the end. Um, it, it is found that it can uh, depend where you're looking at, what kind of surface it is in arid region. It might have a little larger errors and, and Limpopo Basin is a semi-arid to arid uh, uh, water basin. So uncertainty can be there. For modeling, um, GLDAS models have several versions and they use several uh, land surface model parameterization. So we focused on CLSM mainly because it had a terrestrial water storage component uh, derived as output. Uh, but there is NOAA and WIC components also in which you actually have to calculate TWS based on soil moisture and snow water equivalent. And so all these, they have their strengths and limitations and they have varying spatial resolutions. These models also do not include a stream flow or routing and uh, they don't represent uh, surface water such as lake or reservoir. So that water is not included in GLDAS. Similarly, um, you know, irrigation, groundwater pumping, these are not included. So any anthropogenic influence on, on water balance is not included here. It's just natural uh, water cycle it, that is looked at here and that too, not surface water. Um, GL, but this is the something to note about that GLDAS2 uh, simulations uh, now have a routing scheme it's called HiMap2 and that will be released once uh, the analysis is concluded and um, it's checked. And so routing output will include rivers and floodplains in this case. So a new version will have a routing scheme included in it, but right now it is not there. So the LDAS models and retrievals of remote sensing based water components, they are continually e evolving and improving. Um, uh, regional validation of these data with in-situ measurements are required to assess biases and uncertainties in these data. And that's, a, that's one point that we want to emphasize that uh, in your region, if you want to use this data, it's extremely important to validate with in-situ data. So some of the recommendations here is, is use of improved and more accurate products um, so, especially for evapotranspiration, um, a number of products are being put out. Uh, that is going to be a portal, it's called um, OpenET, and that will be available soon, uh, later next year or so. And that will have more accurate and validated evapotranspiration. 
uh, more accurate grace and grace follow-on data uh, what we used was JPL estimates, um, mostly to show the procedure. But as we mentioned in the GRACE webinar and also can be found in GRACE website on JPL is that uh, you can combine um, GRACE products from three different centers here, JPL, GFC, and CSR. Uh, that's been recommended that if you combine them and take mean of these products, then that's more accurate. So you can do that. Also, there is a newer version of Grace mask on data that is also available. There is, um, there is scaling involved here. And so for simplicity and for demonstration purpose, we focused on JPL data, but um, you can, uh, in your region, you can work with these newer data or more accurate data. <coughs> Also, for modeling, um, there is a focus on uh, customized ensemble modeling approach. Uh, there is a land information system uh, that's uh, available from NASA. Uh, this software uh, can be customized for any region in which remote sensing data are assimilated and in situ data are also used. Uh, this may, uh, this will also include, has to include appropriate stream flow routing model. And that way you are actually looking at um, all the water budget components with better accuracy and then that would yield um, better water component estimates. So you can actually look at water budget with little more certainty. Uh, also, one thing for sure, we just focused on two seasons. You, If you do this for multiple years and you have in-situ data or if you have discharge data in your um, watershed, then you can compare that and that um, will give you some idea of biases and um, uncertainties involved in these various data sets. So in conclusion, what we saw is that despite the uncertainties, in remote sensing and GLDAS data, they can be used to assess seasonal and interannual variations in individual water budget components. So precipitation, evapotranspiration, water storage and runoff, they can be um, evaluated individually. Uh, look at the differences from season to season or year to year and it, it gives you indication of increase or decrease in water availability um, for relatively large river basins as we saw. Um, to, uh, the remote sensing and GLDAS data should be validated with in situ measurements, including precipitation, stream flow, soil moisture, and vegetation in the area of your interest. Uh, that's uh, very, very important. And evaluation of empirical methodology or local knowledge that you are using in your watershed. Uh, if you compare that uh, with remote sensing and GLDAS based data, that will help in assessing the usefulness of these data. So what your existing methods are, what you are already using, and if you use these data, what are the differences? And that, that can be very helpful and give you insight into how to work with different data sets. And also um, feedback about usefulness and limitations of data, these data that you encounter. So if you use remote sensing data or modeling data, and if you compare with your uh, empirical or methodology or data that you are using. Um, if you find something that um, it's useful or if you think that some barrier in using that, if you give us feedback based on your own experience, that is very welcome. And so with that, what we can do is um, start with the exercise. And before doing that, um, we want to acknowledge um, our colleagues here, without their help, uh, this webinar um, would not be the same. So we really want to thank um, experts here who are working with GLDAS and hydrologic modeling and uh, GRACE data. So Dr. Hiroko Bodoa and Dr. Oxto uh, Chetirana, they are both from Guard Space Flight Center. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Zaitchik from Johns Hopkins University and Dr. Felix Landerer from NASA GPL um, for GRACE data. So we want to thank um, them for their help uh, and uh, helping us understanding um, water budget components from different sources. So with that, I will um, stop uh, my sharing my screen and you can work on the exercise, it's the lab time. 
and you can estimate uh, GLDAS 2.1 based water budget components for year 2019. Uh, we will be here online if you have any questions. You can also type questions in the chat box. Um, about 11.30 Eastern time or in about uh, 40 minutes or so, we will start um, with question and answer session. Uh, you will have this time, uh, after this session is over, you will have time to complete your exercise and submit the homework. So um, you can just work on the exercises now. And if you have any questions, you can type them. Thank you. So we will be starting with the question and answer session right now. Um, you have time to complete your exercise um, after today and before your homework is due. So we will go to the questions that we have received here. And we also have uh, Dr. Augusto Chetirana. He is the expert in, in GLDAS, also in, in hydrology. So if you have any specific questions, um, he may be able to address those. So the first question is, is there any tool or, or to automate all these processes or do we have to write code? So yes, um, you can get the data using the tools that we, we showed and you can do these calculations in QGIS as we showed, but for, for bulk processing or if you have number of years and bigger area, you have to write code to do the calculations. Why did GLDAS shift to ECMWF when a lot of debate on unremedied uncertainties of ECMWF is going on? So this is um, ECMWF forecasting system is used here. And it is used for a specific purpose because GLDAS 2.2 is used for weekly drought monitoring. And so the lower the latency of data, uh, forcing data, better it is. And, and because of that, ECMWF data are used. And it is one of the better products as um, it's believed by the community, it's one of the better products. So Augusto, please add anything that you uh, want to to any of these questions. It would be great. OK, let me take a look. So um, the question three is something that I want to demonstrate uh, last week also. It says, what parameters should we take into account to determine which are the months of dry season or months of wet season. So for now though, we base that um, on just precipitation data. You can look at soil moisture, but just to quickly see, you can use Giovanni and I just have an example here. Um, what you can do is uh, go to, uh, Giovanni, and here I have used iMERGE monthly data that you used last week. Um, in the select plot, you have option about time series and you can have seasonal time series. And then for here, you can choose either different months, as you can see, or seasons, and you can specify which years to use. And here again, I focused on Limpopo watershed. Um, and once you plot data, you get time series uh, like shown here and that tells you um, that you can this is december january february which is the wet season june july august which is the dry season so we picked based on precipitation and you can do that for your own area of interest just make the time series to see how seasonal uh, precipitation is changing and then you can decide uh, you can do it month by month and uh, 
pick certain months as dry months and certain months as uh, wet months. So I hope that clarifies uh, question three. So um, question four is, doesn't runoff need to be routed over the basin? And I would request Dr. Jetarana to address that. This is question four. Yes, yeah, so yes. Uh, so the runoff needs to be routed over the basin. Uh, currently, there are no, um, there's no routing in Jerdas, but uh, we are working on including uh, stream flow simulations in this next generation <clears throat> of GLDAS. Uh, if you're if you're working at a like a um, a longer time scale like monthly or annual um, depending on the basin routing the the runoff it may not be required because uh, the monthly time step could be enough for all the, the runoff uh, being generated within the basin to uh, flow, to go through the outlet. Uh, this means that you, um, at the monthly time step, you can um, just uh, accumulate the runoff and consider that as the, the average monthly stream flow. But that, that also depends on the, the size of the basin. For example, for in, in the Amazon, um, it takes longer for the runoff to, to be generated from being generated to get to the outlet. But uh, for other basins, like, let's say um, like smaller basins, um, like Mississippi, for example, you can assume that the monthly time step um, could, should be enough for the, the runoff to be converted into a uh, stream flow. So question five is about, uh, do we get some other satellite products with higher resolution for evapotranspiration, runoff and precipitation? So, okay, I didn't see this. Uh, so yes, so GLDAS 2.2 is, um, it's about quarter degrees. So it's not one kilometer, of course, but Evapotranspiration from satellite, it's available at higher resolution, 500 meters for mod 16. And there are also Landsat based products which can be of 30 meter resolution. Um, for, um, for one kilometer resolution of runoff and precipitation, um, I, I don't think they're available uh, from, from the models that we have. And Precipitation data from, I think, CHIRP, they are five kilometers and IMERGE are 10 kilometers. So no, I think one kilometer precipitation data globally are not available. So why is PED negative? I think precipitation minus evapotranspiration can be negative for, for a few months that we looked at showing overall water deficit or loss that there is more evapotranspiration than precipitation received. And also about count columns in decimal numbers. Yes, if because these are one degree resolution uh, grids. So some sub basins have partial grids included in them. That's why you see that. It, last time we did not include count, but if you looked at grace data, it is the same. Uh, you will see that uh, decimal counts of fraction. Um, and this is again for Dr. Chetrana. Please explain how to treat ba base flow in a watershed where it is not negligible. So Augusto, can base flow runoff is is part of groundwater or no? No, so uh, base flow um, from these model outputs um, is considered as, the, as part of the total runoff. Okay. So when you're routing your runoff, uh, so actually we call it a total runoff, that is the this summation of 
uh, surface runoff and base flow. Yes. So okay. base flow should be taken into account. So you just add runoff and base flow runoff and treat that as yes. total. And, and that, that's yeah, that's the total total runoff. Question eight is how precise are these satellite-based precipitation evapotranspiration runoff values? Are these values close to those measured from the ground? So um, these data do not have the same precision everywhere. So it is it's difficult to say that how precise they are in a particular water basin or watershed. Um, that's why we recommend that uh, some in situ validation of different data sets have to be there. Uh, precipitation is something you can measure with point measure uh, like rain gauge and you can have stream gauge measurements and then they can help in, in, uh, in looking at biases between what you get from satellite or model data and what you get from in situ data. But that's the only way to look at uh, uncertainties. So you have used TWS data sets as it is. You don't remove the seasonal cycle from it. Could you please briefly explain if there is any role of seasonality in calculating the water budget? Um, and so I will, uh, we used it, the change in storage, as you saw, for a season. So I don't think their seasonality matters. But uh, Augusto, you, you may add something, whether uh, seasonality. Uh -huh. I'm just uh, reading question. the question. question. Yeah, so I, I, you usually remove the seasonal cycle when you're looking at trends. If you're, if the goal is to uh, decompose the TWS as you're trying here. Um, so that's not how you should use TWS. So yeah. So if you want to look at because, very because I mean that because uh, the seasonality, I mean you you see you, uh, total runoff and ET uh, composes the uh, TWS seasonality. So it make doesn't make much sense to remove that seasonality. To combine TWS with ET and um, put a runoff and precipitation. So only if you want to look at uh, variability and change over time. Yeah, the trends. If you're looking at trends, then it yeah. makes more sense. Right. Um, question 10 is, wouldn't water pumping and irrigation be encompassed with the GRACE GLDAS change in water storage variable? So GLDAS 2.2 where GRACE is assimilated, uh, would water pumping be part of that? Would that be reflected in the model output? Yeah, so uh, GLDAS doesn't simulate uh, human activities. Right. So that is not... Um, that those impacts are not taken into account. So when you, you assimilate GRACE, uh, so you basically, and, and GRACE observes these, the, 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 the impact of these activities. So you change the model states, like groundwater, um, you know, soil moisture, snow, um, and the fluxes as well, you see, and the runoff in a way that the, the that impact will be represented in the, the storages, but uh, you're still not representing the activity, the you know the the human okay. activities. You're just like changing the model, like forcing the model to tell you something that you want to listen from it. Like you're you kind of uh, pushing the model to tell you some a, a different story. Yes. So the the model will be changed in in a way that. The, those states will represent that impact, even though that impact is not originally represented in the model. Hmm. 
So could you provide a reference with dis which describes difference between all these models? And you can go to this LDAS and the website where there are publications there. The, uh, the PI is Metro Hotel. You can contact him for um, publications also or more information. Okay, this is something that uh, could we be able to calibrate with the in situ stream flow data? What would be the size of the watershed? Um, Augusto, I, I think this is your question. Okay. Question 12. Can cal calibrate the model? Uh, is that ca calibrate what? Question 12. It says, can could we be able to calibrate with the in situ stream flow data? So I think the question is, can you calibrate any of these models with in situ stream flow data? Yes, when you're simulating, if you're simulating the, the stream flow uh, with these models, yes, you can. There, there are many studies um, showing that, like different ways to calibrate um, hydrological models using uh, in situ stream flow data. So how to incorporate snow melt into the basin water budgeting, presumably with GLDAS or other methodology? So GLDAS does have uh, snow melt data, right? Um, would that be considered part of runoff, Augusto, or how does it work? Well, that's a different variable. OK. I mean, that, that's an, you, you, can, you can get snow melt as an independent variable. Okay. Yeah. So that's available. But, uh, but it's also included. You don't have to add that to uh, total runoff. So that is also included in the total runoff. Uh, you know, in the cold areas, the high latitudes or high altitudes. Okay. So it's already included in the total runoff. Yeah. Okay. But uh, you can also find that uh, yes. specific variable. Yes, you know, it is there. Independently. Question 14 is, when available in situ data are not overlapping with any collected data from the existing remote sensing data, how is the best way to perform the validation? How reliable would that validation be? So if you don't have any in situ data, really, you're not validating anything. Um, you, are just you can take remote sensing based estimations and you can look at these various models. Um, so GLDAS has multiple uh, parameterizations like NOAA or WIC or CLSN. CLSN. Uh, you can look at numbers you get from these different models and remote sensing that will give you range of uncertainties. And that's the first approximation you can take that, okay, uh, no matter which one you use, it, it may be uncertain by this much amount. But if you don't have any in situ data, there, uh, there's there's no way to decide how accurate uh, actual uh, these numbers are. You, uh, you need some in situ data. Another way I can think of is that if you have similar region, uh, so similar climate conditions in some of the other regions where you have in situ data, maybe based, and if accuracy is known there, then based on that, you can come up with some approximation, but uh, if you don't have any validation data, it's very difficult. Um, if you want to add anything, Augusto or Sean, please go ahead. Oh, that's good. Question 15 is from last week's exercise, was this the TWS data for the dry season, which was in negative values? I was wondering what the anomaly realistically means for the basin. As a follow-up, my total discharge values also came out to be negative. Would that um, conclude that the basin is water deficit? So um, you are looking at seasons uh, rather than long-term or over a one cycle. So, so then, yes, negative means there is at the, in that season there is water deficit 
But overall, if you look at the entire cycle for, for annual cycle, um, that number may be different, that will be different. So, but yes, so negative change in water storage would be deflecting that basin is water deficit. Well, the other possible conclusions could be that, you know, the, these data sets are not perfect. Yes, so it could so, be part of you know, Yeah, the, the error, the uncertainty. Um, so the uncertainty that we mentioned, yes, it is based on the range of, um, or, or, it, yeah, it, it is sum of all some basin. So it's over entire Limpopo basin, yes. So question 17 is, does ET also multiplied by 3,624 multiplied by days? Yes, because if that is also in kilograms per meter square per second. So since we were looking for per month, um, we multiplied by this uh, number. So you can continue working on the exercise and then please submit all the homeworks by the due dates. Also, you will receive a survey from our set. Uh, this is for your feedback about um, this webinar. And so your feedback always is very important to us. So please, uh, take time to fill out the survey questions. It tells us about how we can improve or what could have been done differently. Um, so please do uh, complete the survey when you receive an email from our set. So if there are no more questions, we will close the session in a few minutes. Uh, we will be here for a few more minutes if you have any more questions. Um, we want to thank Dr. Augusto Jatirana for joining today and for his time. Well, thanks for inviting. It was a pleasure. Thank you. OK, question 18 is for the purpose of downloading data from Moody's ET from appears. For Ganges, it was showing error due to complexity in the shape file. What should be done for it to overcome? You can actually draw a polygon around the basin. It appears has that feature also. You can take a polygon around the basin. And once you have the data in QGIS, you can crop it or clip it to your shape file. Um, okay, so question 19 is the, the resolution of GLDAS 2.2 is, fi is finer than 2.1, but the precipitation does not exist. Is there a possibility to use GLDAS 2.1 data? What will be the special resolution? So that is one degree. GLDAS 2.1 is a one degree resolution. Um, you can use GLDAS, NOAA, um, or WIC. I think they are quarter degree resolution and they have precipitation.
Okay, so the question 20 is, is it recommended to estimate water budget estimation for two river basins, which are 89,000 kilometers square, which is and 120,000 kilometers square combined at level 05 of water hydro sheds, especially in the context of uncertainty involved with grace data. That is, what is your recommendation for estimating a river basin water budget estimation having an area approximately 90,000 kilometers square? So yes, that's a, that's a good question. You can use um, GLDAS with a quarter degree resolution. Um, or you can, uh, uh, Augusto, can you can you tell us how high resolution LIS can have? LIS. Hmm. Um, so well, you, you can you can. Uh, I've been running LIS at uh, two hundred meters for some specific cases, so there's no real limitation in terms of uh, special resolution. But uh, for for the, the question here in terms of grace, well. I mean, it's recommended that you, the, the the area should be around like 150,000 oh. square kilometers. That's for you to so you minimize the the errors related to grace. But I mean, if your basin uh, is smaller than that, you I mean, you can still use it, but uh, you should just be you know aware of the fact that your you know the grace time series that you get will be won't be as reliable. There'll be a, a higher error. Mm. I mean, there are there's some, uh, I've seen cases um, like people applying grace to much smaller mm. domains. But um, I mean, uh, as long as you're, you know about the error that is included in the, the data set, that, I mean, it should be fine. Yeah, so I think it, it, you just have to be careful that what you see there, it has larger errors at smaller domain size. Exactly. So Sean McCartney and I thank you for attending this webinar session. And we also want to thank the RSET team. We have uh, Brock Levins, um, Selvin hudson Odoi, and Jonathan O'Brien. Um, they have helped in organizing these sessions in many ways. So um, every, thank you, everyone in the RSET team. Uh, thank you, Augusto, for joining today. And so uh, Sean and I, again, thank you for attending this webinar. And we uh, look forward to your feedback through the survey.